for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. How do you assess the big picture of what we have been through as a nation over the last couple of years? I, like you, have lost count of the number of times I've heard uh, the words unprecedented, in living memory, in a generation, since records began. I guess you could say the time that we're living through has been extraordinary. And with each crisis that we are confronted with, the words and events of this book seem to speak louder and louder. Because the Bible doesn't just tell us what has happened, it tells us what always happens. It doesn't just tell us what will happen, but it helps us to make sense of what is happening. And that's really one of the ways that we know that the time that we're living in isn't extraordinary at all. Actually, the time that we are living in is uh, very ordinary, sadly. It's, it's only extraordinary if you consider the totality of human history uh, to be about 70 years long and, and Western. But if history has any more length and breadth than that, then what we're living through is, is actually fairly normal. The reality is that health emergencies, a political instability, inequality and war really has been par for the course. So if you, like me, have ever said, I wonder if things will ever really return to, to normal. History itself tells us it just did. And Peter, one of Jesus' famous apostles, tries to help us with this perspective shift uh, and he he writes a letter to men and women under pressure undergoing hardship and strain and in so doing peter really may as well be speaking to our nation and this is what he says he says this beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you and this is kind of where it's like the Bible's reading our mail. Because the, the phrase that you have used most, perhaps, to describe this last two years is, it's been a strange time. <laughs> We're living in strange times. <laughs> and Peter says this, he says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial as though something strange were happening to you, as though you were living in strange times. Because the truth is this, to, to live in a culture that is surprised by strange times is to live in a culture not considering the end times. By which I mean a culture not considering the reality that there is coming a day that God himself will stand upon the earth and bring with him judgment, bring with him reward, and bring with him an end to this age. T to live in a time that is surprised by strange times, is really to live in a time that is not considering the, 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 their mortality or finality. Uh, to live in a, in a culture that is more concerned really with living its best life than living the afterlife. To, to live in a time that is surprised by strange times is perhaps through its uh, relative peace and prosperity dangerously unaware of its desperate need for God, of your desperate need for God. So that it would seem that our relative prosperity and insulation from strange times has in large part created an environment fertile for us to, to wander away from God. And that's really what we've seen 
since the Second World War over the last 70 to 80 years. That is to say though, God in the last two has been busy, hasn't he? Through what we've lived through, much fallow ground has been broken so that the soil of the hearts of many might be cultivated. And the passage that we had read for us from the Apostle Paul seeks to help us answer the, the why question. Why, why has God been breaking up fallow ground? What, why has God allowed what he has allowed over the last two years? And this is what Paul says. He says this, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul seeks to help us by explaining the, the meaning behind the national and continental trials that we continue to face. He does so by explaining God's purpose in permitting them. And it's this, to make us not rely on ourselves to make us rely on God so it seems that God God isn't afraid to get your attention prepared even to use the darkness so that through it he might call you to his marvelous light and what we've experienced over the last couple of years has been darkness <laughs> and that's actually important to say what we've seen has been dark. From the UK to the Ukraine, epidemiologically, ep economically, and now militarily, we see darkness. And, and the Bible in, in, in Genesis chapter three tries to help us understand where this force of darkness has come from. It tells the story of our first parents, Adam and Eve, who chose to rely on themselves rather than rely on God, rely on their own knowledge, rely on their own understanding. And through that, they would choose to sin. And we all too have been caught up uh, with this rebellion because we too have participated in this original sin. And through sin, there's a satanic force of darkness that has come upon and come into this one time very good earth. A force of darkness that at all times is subject to God, under God's authority, with God choosing to display his authority over the darkness by masterfully working good into every strange time a believer faces. Darkness into light. And that, that brings me really to why I'm here at dawn because here at dawn, we see a, a, a visual demonstration of the things that I'm talking about. Behind me, we see a live dramatization of God turning darkness into light. But the heavens proclaiming this spectacle. And the truth is, this is what God does. This, this is what God's about. I tell you, my friend, God, God, God's, God's not afraid of the darkness. He's not discouraged by your darkness. On the contrary, it's what draws him to you. <laughs> because God, since the very beginning, has been the God that, that would step into the darkness and say, let there be light. He, he does it every day. He's doing it now as we speak. What this means, dear friends, is if God is so happy to do this with the skies, consider for a moment how happy he would be to do this same thing in your heart, in your life. I tell you, as he does it, it'll be a hundred times more beautiful to him than what we see behind us. And, and that points really to 
the meaning behind the sunrise, the meaning behind dawn, the reason God has created the elements in this precise way. Because let me tell you this, dear friends, the reason God has made the, the sunrise is to be a reflection of the sun's rise. The reason God has designed the extravaganza behind me to be something of a witness, a metaphor, a pointer, is because it's pointing all the time to the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. God in his wisdom through this preaches to you every day. He preaches to you twice a day with the, the sunset preaching the events of Good Friday where the light of the world would be covered over by darkness and the sunrise preaching the events of Easter Sunday where the light of the world would triumph over the darkness. God has set up for us daily demonstrations, daily showings of the two most important and critical events in human history. And God is so keen for you to catch his daily Good Friday and Easter Sunday address that he would even move the times through the seasons of the sunrise and move the time of the sunset so that as many people can catch his personal gospel appeal as possible. It's clever, it's clever. Because the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The Bible is saying that God preaches the gospel through celestial bodies causing even the sun to sermonize with it being a, a, great, a great picture of God for us, with the sun existing in the heavens, dwelling high above the earth, sustaining all life, being a consuming fire, the light you can't look at without injury, being the light around which everything orbits, being the light that no human effort can get you close to. And though it seems to hide its face in the darkness, it remains there, faithful, steadfast, unmoved, sustaining all life. Friends, God has created the moon because of Christ to be about him, with the moon being the, the, the light that comes close with the moon being the heavenly light that you can see, the moon being the light that comes into the darkness, the moon being the, the one that reflects the glory of the sun, the moon being the one that comes between the sun and the earth, the moon being the light unfazed by the darkness that it's surrounded by, the moon being the light that you can gaze at. And when you look closely, it even bears holes and it has scars on it. Friends, what I'm preaching here is, is not some strange teaching because the, the Bible speaks of these things itself. In the very last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 21, it says this of heaven. It says there will be no need of sun or moon to shine on it. No need for sun or moon to shine on it. Why? Because the glory of God gives it light and its lamp or moon is Jesus, the lamb. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims it's his handiwork. Day after day, they pour forth speech or day after day they pour forth preach. Night after night they reveal knowledge. God, dear friend, has been preaching to you, littering gospel clues through the wisdom of his created order. And those gospel clues <laughs> are meant to lead you to a preacher. And that preacher 
is to say the following, that 2000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the son of God, he was crucified. The light of the world was, was snuffed out. The darkest day in human history with the creator being killed by his creation. But that would lead to, to the greatest light that anyone has ever seen with Jesus being raised from the dead by God the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. Raised from the dead physically, raised from the dead bodily, not like a spirit or a ghost, but very much a, a healthy, warm-blooded, flesh and bones, robust man. Jesus' resurrection would be a picture of the resurrection that is to come, where those that have put their faith in Jesus in this life would be raised from the dead with a body like his. So that we now through faith can say, like Paul in Romans chapter eight, verse one, <laughs> that there is now therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Friend, Jesus comes to you today to bring salvation, not damnation. I tell you, that's, that's what he's seeking to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, opening up salvation for all and anyone that would come, come humble to ultimately repent of their sins and put their faith, give their life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus would, 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 would reveal himself, would show himself to his disciples, presenting himself to disciples who ultimately would become witnesses of the resurrection, like a court. That, that calls witnesses up to testify about the validity of the events that they had seen. So too the disciples of Jesus were called by God to be witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Testifying as men under oath to what they had heard, what they had seen with their eyes, what they had looked upon, what they had touched with their hands, with the New Testament letters being witness statements and signed affidavits to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would preach this resurrection, willing and prepared even to die for the truth of the evidence that we now explore in detail in the Alpha Course. And history records that they would die. All of them, almost, one by one, with Peter killed, Andrew killed, Philip killed, Bartholomew killed, Matthew killed, Thomas killed, James killed, Simon killed, Paul killed, more were killed. Why? Because they, they would refuse to, refuse to lie. They would refuse to harm the testimony of the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostles preached. And so with that being said, God will preach to you through the dawn. God will preach to you through his disciples. But God will preach to you through disasters and darkness as well. And that's what he's been doing, dear friends, this last two years. From, from infections to invasions. God has been working to show you the, the uncertainty of your riches and the certainty of your death. And because after such a long period of peace and prosperity, God, God's been doing exposition, carefully, methodically, systematically, showing you the fertility of almost every area that you and I have put our hope in. If you've placed your hope in politics, we've seen, we've seen confidence eroded with alleged parties on, on one side and allegations of anti-Semitism on another. If you've placed your confidence in public health, we've been hit by a one-time unimaginable global pandemic. If you've placed your confidence in your social life, we've seen pubs, clubs, bars, cafes closed at the drop of a hat for months. If you've placed your confidence in family, uh, we've been unable to kiss our mums, witness the birth of our daughters and sons, and even attend the funerals of our dead. If you've placed your confidence in food, we've seen empty shelves in supermarkets and rationing of key items. If you've placed your confidence in your autonomy, 
we've been forbidden from leaving our homes. And then when we were allowed to leave our homes, months later, we would see fights on fuel forecourts and queues hours long at petrol stations. If you've placed your confidence in sport, we've had to watch reruns of Euro 96. If you've placed your confidence in holidaying, we've seen travel bans. If you've placed your confidence in the NHS, we're seeing record wait times and a struggle to even see our doctor face to face. If you've placed your confidence in policing, there has sadly grown an increasing distrust with allegations of, of misogyny and racism in cases like that of Sarah Everard. If you've placed your confidence in the environment, we see forest fires raging, the climate changing and increasingly concerning numbers of severe weather events. If you've placed your confidence in race, we've been rocked by racially motivated killings, even in the last week. And, and issues of covert and overt racism and discrimination continue to rage on. If you've placed your confidence in the arts, we've seen violence at the Oscars. If you've placed your confidence militarily, we're now seeing a war in Europe, in Europe, in our backyard. A war that threatens to escalate, a war that even threatens to spread. If you've placed your confidence in the economy, we've seen recession in 2008, recession in 2020 and inflation in 2022. Dear friends, God has been trying to communicate something to you. And what he's been trying to communicate is this, that it's all been to make you and I not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. These things, friends, though in and of themselves, they're not necessarily bad, but they will all prove to be false dawns. Perhaps you're a person that is at the moment going through, just living through some, just has some debt. And maybe, maybe for you, you're hearing news even this very month of, council tax going up, national insurance going up, gas going up, fuel going up, electric going up, water rates going up, food costs going up. Perhaps when you hear the Apostle Paul in our passage say that in his situation he felt so utterly burdened that he despaired of life, perhaps you would say that's exactly how I feel. Maybe for you, it's, it's you've been struggling with long COVID. Maybe you, you say to yourself, I wonder if I'll ever be kind of back to what I used to be. Maybe, maybe you felt this way as you've watched the invasion of Ukraine. So utterly burdened, despairing of life, burdened beyond my strength. This is why Paul would say on him, we have set our hope on him. Because dear friends, Jesus knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to not have enough money to pay tax, Matthew chapter 17. He knows what it's like to live under the constant threat of an evil regime, Matthew 26. Jesus knows what it's like to be under so much pressure that he would even sweat blood. Luke chapter 22. And dear friends, Jesus knows what it's like to die. And because Jesus knows what it's like, because Jesus has been there, because Jesus has, has gone through it all and come out the other side, raised from the dead, Jesus would be the one uniquely qualified to lead you through these same situations in life. Jesus would be the one uniquely qualified to be shockingly sympathetic. Jesus would be the one uniquely qualified because there is no one else in heaven or on earth that knows you better or loves you more. So dear friends, COVID cases may have risen. Tensions in Europe may have risen. The cost of living, living may have risen. But I tell you this, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he has risen and he loves you and he cares for you. 
So let me encourage you, give your life to Jesus. He takes you by the hand now. He raises you up from the, the floor of despair in this life. And he takes you by the hand and raises you from the grave in the next. And I tell you friends, that is a true dawn.